to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. We welcome you today to our study of what is the church of Christ. What do you know about the Lord's church, the church we read about in the Bible, God's people, His family? What do we know about the Lord's church? And so we're so glad that you joined us for our study on this wonderful subject today. As always, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to God's Word as the final authority in all matters. And friend, we're so glad that you've tuned in to our broadcast today. We want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Lord's body. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that's on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday. They'd be happy to have you at any of their worship assemblies. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to learn more about the Lord's Church or the plan of salvation or anything that they do. These people would be happy to sit down with you and study the Word of God anytime. And friend, we want you to know that here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in your study of God's Word. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study materials that you can learn from and grow from as a Christian. And so check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a CD or a DVD, if you'd like to have transcripts or study questions of any of our lessons, they're all free of charge. You can download those from our website, or if you'd like to have a hard copy, we have those available free of charge as well. And in today's fast-moving world, we want to encourage you to download the Gospel of Christ app, available both in the Apple and Android Play stores, and they're both free and a great way to study the Word of God on the go. Let's begin by thinking about why there is such a great need to study this subject. Why does a person need to think about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? And friend, we want you to know from the outset that our aim and our purpose, first and foremost, is to speak the truth. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth. And as Christians, as followers of God, we have a great responsibility to speak God's truth on this issue. Proverbs 23, verse 23 says, Not only do we have a responsibility to speak it, but every hearer has a responsibility to that as well. The Bible says we are to buy the truth and sell it not. If it's truth, regardless of the cost, regardless of what changes may be necessary, my responsibility is to accept truth and put that to use in my life. And friend, the value of the truth cannot be underestimated. Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. What is it that sets men free from sin and removes them from the stranglehold of the devil? The truth sets people free. John chapter 8 verse number 32. But friend, let's also realize this. There's a great need for this study because not only do we want to speak the truth, we want to do it the right way. Let's hear the rest of Ephesians 4.15. Paul said to speak the truth in love. Friend, we want you to know that out of a sincere love, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, for men and women's souls, we're saying these things today. Our motivation, our aim, the reason we're bringing these lessons is because we love souls and we want men and women to go to heaven. We don't want anybody, God doesn't want anybody to be lost. 1 Timothy 2, 4, 2 Peter 3, 9, and at the gospel of Christ. 
We feel the same way about men and, women, men and women's souls. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, verse 5, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. To say what God says is better than to skirt around the issue and act like we love people when in reality, if we love them, we would say what the Bible says. There's a great need for this study also because men and women need clarity on clear subjects, on the subjects God talks about in the Bible. When I think about the clarity of speaking the way God wants us to, there's a minor prophet, a passage mentioned in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 that I often think of. God said to the minor prophet Habakkuk, make it so plain that he who runs may read it. John 10 verse 25, they said to Jesus in verse 24 and 25, tell us plainly. And friend, we want to make it so clear and so plain that people can understand what God says. You know, when I think about this idea of making it plain that the, the person who runs can read it, I think about this. You're driving down the interstate at a high rate of speed, 70 miles an hour, billboards are coming at you, and the messages, you never miss those messages. Why? They're so concise, so plain, and so clear, even though you're moving at a high rate of speed. You can get the point. Friend, that's the way gospel preaching, that's the way clear proclamations of God's message ought to be. But friend, let's be clear today as well. Our main emphasis in speaking on these subjects is ultimately to please God. Galatians 1 verse 10, Paul said, if I wanted to be a servant of man, I wouldn't be speaking on this in essence. Galatians 1 verse 10, that's why he's a servant of Almighty God. Ultimately, we want to please God and make Him happy in the things that we say and do. Now friend, what's the backdrop? What are we trying to achieve? What's the purpose of, of bringing lessons to men and women on the Lord's church? Please understand. We're not trying to anger. We're not trying to make anybody our enemy. That's the opposite of what we want to do. Paul said in Galatians 4.16, Have I become your enemy because I preach or speak the truth? Friend, all those some of the things we say in this series of lessons on the Lord's church may be different may be uh, unique, may be things that you've not seen or read or heard in the Bible if they're from the Word of God. Please understand our aim is not to anger or upset. We want men, according to Ephesians 6, 4 and Hebrews 10, verse 24, we're trying to help men and women draw near, draw closer to God through His truth and through His Word. And thus we're not out to make enemies or upset anyone. My friend, also realize this. Please understand, we're not saying we're the only sincere religious people, but also realize sincerity alone won't save anybody. Romans 10 verse 2, Paul said of his own countrymen, of those who were caught up in Judaism and its tradition just like he was. Paul said, they have a zeal for God, but not according to truth. Are there zealous people who have a desire to please God and a desire to go to heaven and ultimately to do what you bet there are? But sincerity without truth won't save anybody. We want sincere, God-fearing, God-seeking people to hear the truth on the church so that they can be right with Almighty God. And friend, please understand, this is such a powerful point. Anyone who obeys God's truth can be right with Him. The Bible says again in John 8 verse 32, you can know the truth and the truth will make you free. Ephesians 3 verses 3 and 4 says, when we read, we can understand God's will. And so anyone who will come to the Bible with an open and honest heart and do what it says, they can absolutely be right with God and live before Him in purity. But as we think about the idea of the Lord's church, we want to ask, what then is the individual's responsibility to truth? 
If I hear the truth, or as we think about truth, what's my responsibility? Well, friend, first and foremost, let's realize my responsibility is to demand that I hear and know God's truth, not the ideas and opinions of men. I, I love the words of John 10, verse 24 and 25. Jesus had already told them on multiple occasions, but this time they come to Jesus and they say, tell us plainly if you're the Christ. And Jesus did indeed tell them. But that's what men and women need. That's the attitude we need today. Tell us plainly what God says on this matter. And friend, please understand. There's a whole lot of people who want to skirt around the issues. There's a whole lot of people who proverbially want to beat around the bush. And that won't help anybody. And the long ago, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 5, verse 30 and 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love to have it so. But then there was this question, and God said, but what will you do in the end? Beating around the bush, skirting around the issues, tiptoeing over this is not going to help anybody come closer to God. And so men and women need to demand to know and hear God's truth. And then, of course, we need to listen very, very carefully to what the Bible says. There's a common refrain that you will find in every letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. God will say to those people, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear. What's God saying? Listen very carefully to what I'm saying. Friend, our responsibility to the truth is to listen very carefully to what the Bible says. Take heed what you hear. Mark 4 verse 24. Take heed how you hear it. Luke 8 verse 18. And as the Bereans in Acts 17 verse 11, they searched the Scriptures daily to see if what Paul was teaching them was true to the Word of God. And so we want to make sure we're listening very carefully to the Bible, to what God says. But you know, even if we demand to know and hear the truth, even if we listen very carefully to the Bible, we still have another responsibility, and it's this. I've got to take what I've demanded to hear. I've got to take what I've seen to be from the Bible, and I've got to apply that to my heart and life to hear it, to open up my Bible and see it's uh, in the pages of the Word of God, that won't do anything if I don't put it into action in my life. Philippians 4 verse 9, Paul said, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. It's not enough just to go out and look up in heaven and say, Lord, Lord. Not, Jesus said, not everybody who does that is going to heaven. Who is then? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so we hope that as we've mentioned some things leading up to this, that those things will be on our heart and mind as we think about the Lord's church. Let's then turn our attention to thinking about some characteristics of the church. And as we do that, friend, there's a lot of confusion in our world about the church. Let's begin by thinking about, we often hear people talk about the church or something related to the church and, and sometimes wonder, is that really what the church is? Let's think for a few moments about common explanations or common terms we hear about the church that's really not the church in the Bible. Here are a few of those. What is the church not? Well, friend, as you read the Bible, it is clear the church is not the building. Acts 7, verse 48 through 50, the Apostle Paul said, God does, listen to this, God does not 
dwell in temples with, made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, what house will you build for me, says the Lord. Has not my hand made all these things? Friend, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about beautiful, ornate stained glass. We're not talking about comfortable pews. We're not talking about a pulpit or a building located on a street corner somewhere. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the building. Jesus didn't die for the building, did He? Acts 20, verse 28. Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. He didn't die for two-by-fours and cinder block. No, that's not what He died for. Jesus died for more than an edifice that we sometimes refer to as the church. Secondly, let's realize that the Lord's church is not Worship, And by that we mean this. Sometimes we say, when we're about to go worship God, we say, I'm going to go to church. Well, wait a minute now. Is the church worship? The church does worship. There's no doubt about that. John 4, verse 23 and 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, friend, let's realize the church is not the same thing as worshiping God. God's people go to worship, we gather together to worship, but, but, but here's the problem in that. Sometimes we disconnect the idea of this, that every day of my life, as I live for the Lord, I'm a member of the Lord's church, whether I'm at work, whether I'm on the ball field, whether I'm at home, or whether I'm assembled with the saints, every day, not just at worship, I'm a member of the Lord's church. What else is the church not? Friend, the church is absolutely not a denomination. I want you to take your Bible, and I want to ask you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Look at what the Scripture says here. My denomination, we carry with it the idea of, of division or naming after another. The church you read about in the Bible is absolutely not any of those things. Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13. Paul said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, listen to this, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Well, well, Paul, what was going on? For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are divisions among you. Now I say this, each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friend, when we think about de denomination, dividing, division, the Bible says, let there be no division among you. Well, the very idea of a denomination carries with it, inherent in the word, naming after another. And the Lord said, some are, you are saying, I'm a Paul, I'm Paulus, I'm... or any of those crucified for you? Did Paul die for you? Let there be no divisions among you. Friend, the modern religious landscape that we see in our world today with a denomination on every corner carrying a different name, teaching different ideas, dividing the body of Christ, that is so foreign and contrary to what you read in the New Testament. What else is the church not? Friend, let's realize this. The church is not a human, man-made organism. It's just not. Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4, God prophesied that, when, that, that the gospel would go forth to Jerusalem, all nations would flow to it, and God would set up His house from Jerusalem. We read in 1 Timothy 3, 15, that the church is the house of the living God. Daniel 2, verse 44, Daniel prophesied, that during the time of these four kingdoms, the Babylonian, the Greeks, the Medo-Persians, and the Roman era, God would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. And then we open our Bible to Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up in Jerusalem for the very first time, preaches salvation in Jesus as a present reality. And those who obey the gospel, listen to these beautiful words. The Bible says the Lord added them to His church. Friend, we're not talking about a man-made human organism. 
We're talking about God's eternal kingdom set up and established by Jesus in the first century. And friend, as we think about the church, let's realize the church is not of little value. Sometimes when I hear people talk about the church, they want to talk about, give me Jesus, let's think about salvation, I want to hear more about Christ, but don't talk to me about the church. Is the church worthless? That's not the case. Jesus died for it, didn't He? Acts 20, verse 27 and 28, the Bible says, the Lord purchased the church with His own blood. And so we talk about the church, we're talking about something that is of great value, so much so that Jesus died for it. Well, then let's switch gears. What then, if these things are not the church, what is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Friend, the Lord's church, as we think about this word in the New Testament, the word in the original language is the word ekklesia. And I know that's a lot of Greek to throw out, but please understand it just simply means this. The word church means the called out or the assembly. You see, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 and 15 says that we are called by the gospel. God says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 and 18, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. And so when we think about what is the Lord's church, it's the called out people. People who have heard the message. You'll call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. Matthew 1, 19 and 20. Those who listened to that message, those who obeyed what Jesus said, they became a part of the called out. His people. His body. And friend, the church is just that. God's own special people. Titus 2, verses 11 through 13. What else do we know about what the church is? We hinted at this earlier. But friend, let's realize the church is the people. I want you to open your Bible with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 27. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want you to see Paul's words here in verse number 27, to the church of God at Corinth and to Christians. Paul says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. What's the church? The church is the body. The church is the people. We. Why is the church important? Because it's made up of souls. God's concerned about souls. God's concerned about people. And all the saved people are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else do I know the church is? Friend, I know who owns the church. Uh, the Bible says, Jesus speaking in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, after Peter had noted, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus turned and said, and I say to you that you're Peter. And on this rock, on this foundational truth, I'm the Son of God. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Lord purchased the church with His own blood. Who does the church belong to? Jesus said, I'll build my church. Friend, we understand that when we talk about other things. Let's say you buy a car or you buy a home and somebody comes up, sees that car you're riding in, they says, man, that's a nice car. Who's that belong to? Oh, it's my neighbor so there. Somebody knocks on your door and says, is this your house? No, I just, I'm just staying here. It belongs. No, that's not the way it works. This is my house. This is my car. My blood, my sweat, my tears have paid the note on that. It belongs to me. My friend, the same is true. About the Lord's church. Can anybody just go out and put their name on the church and call it theirs? No. Jesus purchased the church, His church, with His own blood. And it belongs to Him. And friend, let's notice this. The church is singular in its nature. I want you to open your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. And notice what the Scripture says in verse 22 and 23. The Word of God says this. And God, He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. And so when we think about the church, the church is the body. Those are one and the same. They're synonyms. Now flip over to Ephesians 4, verse number 4. Paul said, there's one body and one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above you all and through you all and in you all. And so as we think about 
the church, friend, we're talking about the church and the body being synonymous. And so if the church is the body, listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is but one body. Now, in that context, we ask ourselves, how many lords are there? Well, there's only one Lord. How many faiths are there? Only one faith. How many gods are there? Just one. If the church is the body, and the Bible says there's one body, how many churches did God intend to set up? Just one. Listen to Matthew 16, 18 again. Jesus said, on these rocks I'll build my churches. Is that what He said? No. Jesus said, on this rock singular, I will build my church singular. And so as we think about the church, it's singular in its nature. Jesus built one church. It belongs to Him and it ought to follow His teaching and His plan. And so friend, as we've thought today, about the Lord's church. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, how do I become a member of that church? These things I've seen in the Bible are from God's Word. What do I need to do to become a member of that church? Well, friend, wouldn't it be great for us to just open up our Bible and see what they did in the first century? And that's exactly what we want to do. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. The very first time the gospel is preached. Acts chapter 2, about verses 13 through 35, Peter preaches Jesus as the Messiah. And they heard the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. I know they believed it, for in Acts 2 verse 37, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall... They, they were cut to the heart. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Meaning they realized, believed Jesus was the Son of God. And what did Peter say? Look in Acts 2 verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Let every one of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And those who did that heard the Word of God, believed in Jesus, repented of past sins, and were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. You know what happened to those people? Acts 2.47 says, The Lord, not man, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, friend, we want you to know this. God of heaven loves you deeply. We love you deeply. More than anything in all the world, we want you to become a member of the Lord's body. If you've never done that, we encourage you to do that. If you'd like to study more or talk more about it or learn more about the church, we'd be happy to sit down with you and do that. And friend, we want to encourage you to join us next time as we're going to study more about the church we read about in the Bible. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.